And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man was made a living soul. Genesis 2, Ratio 7 Many of us grew up indoctrinated by some of the Abrahamic religions, which are distinguished into three strands, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All are monotheistic, and conceive of the God of sacred text as being the universal God and creator of all things, and both explain the origin of man from a clay mold, Made by the hands of God himself, the biblical tale goes on to say that after creation, man was placed in the Garden of Eden for him to take care of. It also tells how the woman appeared, which was made from one of Adam's ribs, and later on how the couple would have fallen into disgrace after hearing the malevolent serpent that crawled there, and how God realized that something was in them changed. He was enraged by it, expelling the young couple from paradise, condemning them to a life of work and suffering. We know this story by heart and soul, and despite the purposefully allegorical beauty that the text brings and the perplexing curiosity it causes, it ends up giving the vast majority of people the intelligent and mocking suspicion that everything is just a myth for explaining something complex. Well, we learned in schools that we came and evolved from the monkey. In fact, the theory of evolution doesn't say that man came from the ape. That's a misconception about Darwin's theory. The theory is that we and apes share a common ancestor and belong to the primate group. Anyway, it took a long time for our society to accept the theory of evolution as something much more coherent for our origin. So what else would there be to investigate if already had the answer? And if suddenly the biblical myth is as true or more true than the theory launched in 1859 in the middle of the Victorian era, when Charles Darwin published The Origin of Species, his academic colleagues, the church and the Austria society of the time stoned him in every possible way. And look, in the book, Darwin avoided using the term evolution as much as possible, as it implied creation without divine intervention which was a tremendous and unforgivable blasphemy. Lucky for him, the age of bonfires had passed, but he didn't escape being portrayed in a caricature of a monkey in the famous English magazine Hornet. However, over time, his thesis became the most accepted and most publicized scientific explanation for the diversity of species in nature. On the other hand, the credibility of the Bible and the faith placed in it was automatically and inevitably weakened by the gradual general acceptance of the theory of evolution. It was and is a matter of logic. If man evolved, then he could not have been miraculously created by God. But we have a little problem with Darwin's theory. It was never explained. The leap that humanity took, going straight from Homo erectus to Neanderthal, and then from the Neanderthal to cro magnon without leaving any traces of that huge leap between them, Bones of intermediate beings between Homo erectus and Neanderthal have never been found, and not even between the Neanderthal and the Cro-Magnon. Every so often, candidates for the lost link appear, but they never sustain themselves in their post. As the investigations progress, an other unexplained factor is that Neanderthals appeared some 300,000 years ago, instead of appearing 2 million or 3 million years in the future, following the logic of the evolutionary process. Yes, because if he had evolved naturally from Homo erectus, he would still be back there, at the most primitive stage, not here. After all, this ape species had already roamed the earth for 3 to 4 and is already said to be 8 million years old. According to recent studies, how then did such a big leap come to the Neanderthal, which emerged relatively too recently? We have been closer to the Neanderthal, apparently with few differences such as Homo heidelbergensis, which appeared 600-700,000 years ago, and also Denisovan, and now the Proto-Neanderthals, found in North Africa, and which appeared at that same time, even so, are out of place in the natural time of evolution compared to or close to the primitive species such as Homo erectus, and to that the fact that both Neanderthals and their like, like Homo erectus and its similars, and the Cro-Magnons coexisted until about 40,000 years ago. Various types of the humankind in different stages of evolution coexisting in the same period. One did not cancel out the other. What's up? How can this be explained? The chances are many, none conclusive. Anyway, like the other Homo specimens, they are not considered by science as being sapiens. We will focus directly on Homo sapiens Neanderthalensis, even though nowadays it is already considered that it is not the predecessor of modern man, 
but an indirect relative and thus some researchers reject the term sapiens for him while another part insists that it is a subspecies of homo sapiens so he should keep the sapiens in his surname instead while they decide to do I continue with my line of reasoning where the Neanderthal fits perfectly as a creature displays in the evolutionary rhythm after Homo erectus and as a predecessor of Homo sapiens following the scientific line that considers the same studies on mitochondrial DNA lead to the assumption that the both Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons evolved from a common ancestor and it is only necessary to know when the separation would have occurred the problem is that they did not there are bones that make the connection with this common ancestor other genetic studies have also found that about 200 to 350000 years ago or so there was a sudden change in the human dna strand and no logical explanation has yet been found in other words it is no longer just a matter of finding intermediate bones genetics also shows an inexplicable leap from the homo erectus type to the homo neanderthal assessed type Clearly science still doesn't have all the answers. Here and there, a new bone of some ancestor of modern man is discovered in some place beyond academic common sense. More and more questions are raised, possibilities are explored, genetic discoveries take our breath away and the yearning grows. But still, we still have no answers to that really happened in the past. And like hunters of pirate treasure, lost in time and legend, we follow the dotted lines and decipher the clues that always lead us to another clue. But we still can't fully understand the old worn out leather map. The fact is that from primitive hunters, gatherers of fallen fruit with rustic features, full of hair all over the body, who lived with other animals and drank in rainwater puddles, we were suddenly transformed from an R to the other in gracious beings, city builders, scribes, doctors, teachers, without having had the necessary time for learning based on trials, errors, and successes as theoretically happens in a natural evolution. On the other hand, we can speculate that climbing a tree for shelter or picking a fruit that is already known to be edible by experience passed down from generation to generation or making a spear with a stone point comes from survival instinct, comes from acquired intelligence by observation added to the need to make, to do what's around but. Build cities requires knowledge. And where did all this knowledge come from? All of a sudden, many take spiritual and unquestioning comfort to the religious dogma of creation, to the myth of Adam and Eve. It's kind of weird that part of the talking snake, but that's okay. The important thing is to have faith. Others conform intellectually to the theory of evolution, but deep down the missing link is beautiful flea behind the ear. In one way or another, we glimpse even subtly. There is a missing piece in this puzzle. Is there any other alternative that urges us to keep looking for an answer? Yes, there is. We can venture into the ancient astronaut theory. This theory investigates a possible extraterrestrial interference occurred in the past of Earth and humanity and promises answers that bring the solution to the mystery for the missing link. Have you ever heard of or read about the Mesopotamian clay tablets found in the library of Ashurbanipal too? in the ruins of the biblical city of Nineveh. Around 1840, English and French archaeologists made incredible discoveries. In the midst of the excavations, they found palaces, temples, jewels, statues, the royal library, and inside it, more than 25,000 clay tablets, all with cuneiform writings. These tablets supported everything historical texts, poetry, astronomical records, mathematical formulas, commercial contracts, musical scores, everything, including mythological texts which portrayed the lives of the gods, their deeds, their genealogy, etc. And Zakaria Sitchin was one of the few scholars in the world able to read and interpret ancient Sumerian and Akkadian directly on clay tablets. To write The Twelfth Planet, the first book in a series, and the basis of his theory, Sitchin spent 30 years poring over the translations of the tablets that were already available in various treasures, theses, and books of many authors, in large part linked to archaeology or philology. He also personally investigated many original tablets that he could access in museums around the world, mainly the British Museum in London. Then Sitchin chose the best result of these translations, the ones that made the most sense to him or were the most consistent with each other and compared to them with the biblical text in the moisture Hebrew. And that's when he realized that what the first translators of the Mesopotamian text considered to simply mythology was actually a true story, the history of the Sumerian gods who became known in recent years as the Anunnaki and who one day about 450,000 years ago left their celestial realm and came to earth 
The Bible refers to them as the Elohim and also as the Nephilim. There are several biblical epithets for them and compare them with the biblical text in Masoretic Hebrew. For the celestial realm, the Sumerians named Nibiru. This name was found in the Enuma Elish, which is a copy of a much older Sumerian text where the word Nibiru means crossing because according to the ancient text, the mysterious celestial body that is initially called Marduk in political homage to the god which victoriously dictates to the scribe its Babylonian version of history crosses the solar system from time to time between Mars and Jupiter, precisely in space, where there is an asteroid belt whose rocks always make us wonder if they are not the remains of a planet destroyed a long time, a long time ago. The Mesopotamian text is quite explicit. The number of the celestial bodies of Mulmul is 12. The Sumerians did the math adding up the nine planets we already knew, including Pluto. The twelfth member of the solar system was a Traversia or Nibiru which was pictographically represented with the sign of the cross, a cross decorated with signs that resemble radiation and light, indicating a body with a very strong magnetic field. The cross is one of the oldest symbols in the world. The text speaks of Nibiru. Thus, he peers into hidden knowledge. He sees all the quarters of the universe, the great planet, its appearance dark red, the most radiant from the planets he is. Sitchin assumes it is a brown dwarf, whose spectrum cannot be recognized by ordinary telescope and so has not yet been found in our solar system. Today there is talk of Planet 9, and the coincidences that link it to the hypothetical Nibiru of Sitchin are many. It is an icy planet with a mass of 7 to 10 times quarter than the Earth. It is possibly the size of Neptune and has an eccentric orbit. But coincidences end when you start to deal with the time of orbit and the path that the new member of the Sun family takes. Planet 9 does not pass through the solar system. Between Mars and Jupiter, it embraces all the planets on the outside in large orbit around the Sun, with an estimated time between 15 and 20,000 years. Nibiru's orbit around our Sun is proposed to be 3,600 years old. The Sumerians define this time as one char, which is a mathematical unit, and is equivalent to the years of Nibiru. And now we can glimpse the difference in the life cycles of the Elohim and our Earthlings. If 3,600 Earth years correspond to one Nibiru year, how long lived these beings who were worshipped as gods in the mythologies of the four corners of the ancient world we live at most and painfully 120 years, in some rare cases 200 years, but for the Anunnaki this time is probably just a siesta break after lunch. This gives us an exact idea of why ancient peoples they thought the gods or even the biblical god was immortal, but the texts make it clear here and there that these gods could indeed die. It's not eternal, he just lives long, that these gods could indeed die. We have been dealing all along with the extraterrestrial beings, not the creator god of all things, which the Elohim themselves believed in too. Yes, the Anunnaki believe in God, and the Bible never speaks of the universal eternal God. She talks all the time, from beginning to end, line by line of beings from another planet. But after all, why did the Anunnaki leave Nibiru and undertake a journey to Earth? Because they needed gold. According to Sitchin's theory, all clues indicate that the Elohim came to Earth in search of gold to reclaim their planet's atmosphere. This metal reduced to dust and with technology raised to the sky could heal the wound in the atmosphere which was compromising all the life on the planet. And they were really desperate for the gold of salvation. One team after another arrived on Earth and life here was not easy for the astronauts on the mission. When a team replaced by another that brought young people with a desire for adventure but what they found here was the hard work of digging and mining. Over time they started to get very sick because the poor died and heavy work and especially the fast cycle of the Earth around the Sun. It affected their accustomed metabolisms at another pace. A revolt took place and a rebellion formed. Young people didn't want to spend their lives underground digging, digging. The Earth mission leaders got together and after long philosophical discussions about space routes, decided to create a slave. Through genetic engineering, crossing the ape species that here it was already and at this point, from the description of the being in the old text, Sitchin suggests that it was a female of Homo erectus with the genetic material of a young Anunnaki, as the Babylonian creation myth Enuma Elish tells. Many were the attempts, many were the failures, and many chimeras were created in the process. Legends such as the Minotaur, Centaur, 
Fawn mermaids should be taken more seriously as everything indicates that they really existed. But finally the team succeeded and a more improved being emerged from the scientific experiments. The Anunnaki called him Lulu Amulu which in the Sumerian language means primitive worker. At this point going against the general idea of my colleagues who understand that the crow magnon was the result of the experience I dare to suggest that such being was the Neanderthal due to its physical characteristics, its robustness, cognitive and speech capacity. It was designed for heavy work and it satisfactorily performed the tasks assigned to it. In addition to understanding the symbol commands and orders of its superiors and if necessary Homo sapien and Thalassus could communicate properly. Until some time ago it was believed that this species could not speak, only grunt. This was overland when in 1989 discovered an archaeological site in Israel remains a Neanderthal bones and among the discoveries the hired bone that supposed the musculature at the base of the tongue and without which speech would be impossible. Scientists found that the bone structure showed signs of intense and constant metabolic activity other than that later they also discovered the presence of two characteristics of the Fox P2 gene responsible for speech in modern man. The Neanderthal could speak but the position of the tongue inside the jaw made the speech slurred and slow. All good, that was enough for basic and efficient communication. Soon they made a female pair for him with his own genetic material and both were taken to public display in Edith's botanical laboratory. The Homo of the Righteous, yes I am talking about the biblical garden of Eden. This first couple, a subspecies of the genus Homo sapiens was treated as a matrix and therefore was spared the heavy work. His clones were not so lucky as they grew up and could wield the pickaxe. They were taken to the underground mines. They worked and complained of no fatigue or back pain, enjoyed limited rations and enjoyed being close to the great Elohim. Interestingly, Professor Westcott, president of the Faculty of Anthropology at Madison University, USA, in the book of Divine Animal, says in his studies that the species sapiens presents emotional reactions and social attitudes typical of domesticated species anyways. Astronauts had their well-deserved vacation after centuries of hard work and now spend the daily hunting, swimming, goofing off, sleeping, eating and getting fat. Back in Eden, the children were called by the names they received from their test tube parents. The boy was called Adamu, red as the clay of the earth and the girl was called Tiamat, the mother of life. The form of the first Adam and Eve couple reported in the biblical Genesis and is the one who was expelled from paradise for having tasted the fruit of knowledge which was nothing more than a genetic intervention that enabled the couple to reproduce and thus multiply on its own. Without the need for cloning, Adamu and Tiamat as well as their clones were sterile from the birth because they were hybrids. The cunning serpent that gave such fruit to Eve it was the brilliant scientist who conducted the entire experiment from the beginning, Enki, the Sumerian god of knowledge. The person who expelled the couple from the Garden of Eden was Enlil, the lord of the command, leader of the earth mission and who did so disgusted with the direction of the genetic experiment was taking. What was supposed to be disposable now had the power to multiply. His fear was that they had also given the creature the long life of the gods. This in the long run would pose potential danger to the outnumber Elohim in earth and that's exactly what happened later in the story and we'll talk about that later for now we just need to know that Enlil was against the genetic experiment from the beginning being one of the voices that voted no in the council that discussed the creation of primitive worker on earth. But now it was too late, the reality was there for all to see, appreciate and enjoy. All that remained was to go ahead with the gold mining plans to many every effort and every sacrifice of perhaps never being able to return home. Enlil with his typical military strategic mind will look for a way to try to eliminate the new species at an opportunate time and cleanse the earth of the wrong done. At that moment he had decided to accept what fate had imposed but he did not want to see the bizarre terrestrial couple in front of him. He said to Enki, take them away, you treacherous serpent or something like this. Some time later or rather hundreds of years later, the other Adam and Eve couple appeared, these yes, the parents of Cain and Abel in the book of Genesis, Cro-Magnon man or archaic Homo sapiens arose from the cross between the Anunnaki and the descendant of the laboratory bred specimen. Once again we will have the interference of the serpent of Eden 
Enki realized that with time and the constant consanguine relationship, his precious experiment was somehow regressing to the primitive stage. So he started to look for a solution to the case. And the solution was to have a sexual relationship with the two female descendants of Adamu and Tiamat. The experiment carried out in the middle of the vegetation and under the shade of a tree soon paid off. From the females were born children, a boy and a girl, both hybrids perfected to a higher degree. Enki kept this experiment secret for as long as he could. He told everyone that the new species of terrestrials had arisen naturally in the desert. The boy is called Adapa and the girl is called Titi. They were raised by himself and his wife and were loved as children by her. They were taught everything and they learned everything. In fact, it was from Adapa, the scribe, the genealogy of the terrestrials began to be recorded. Adam's Book of Generations. At this point, it must make a scientific observation. Genetic studies that analyze fossil DNA from Neanderthal women and mitochondrial DNA concluded that we share 2.5 to 4 percent of DNA with Neanderthals, now doing the analysis from the Y chromosome. Later, it was the descendants of Adapa who related and had children, the Nephilim or the famous fallen angels who had nothing of fallen because they didn't fall, they landed. After the flood, a natural catastrophe, not a punishment from God, but one that Enlil knew how to use to try unsuccessfully to exterminate the aberration generated by the original sin, which incidentally is nothing more than the genetic experience that occurred in the past. There was a shift in the social behavior pattern between the Anunnaki and the Earthlings. Man was no longer a slave. He was from then on a supporting role in the construction of the history of the world. Sumeria appeared and Egypt appeared. India appeared and also China. Empires rose and fell. And here we are. Today in the midst of the information and technology age, we can better understand what the ancient text said and allegorical language today without the religious fanaticism that persecuted those who dare to think. We can understand that the Bible does not speak of the creator God of everything, who remains indestructible to the human mind, but of extraterrestrials who ventured into space, found and colonized the earth, and created Homo sapiens. Today that we no longer need to prove ourselves rational and lucid beings, we can admit that the missing link in the theory of evolution can be easily explained by an alternative theory, but no less rational and logical. Darwin's thesis makes perfect sense, but only up to a point. And the Bible isn't telling us stories about the Karo Chinha after all. Everything fits perfectly. What was out of place? It was the misinterpretation of ancient texts by theologians concerned to explain what they could not understand, or did they understand, and just tried for shady reasons to hide under layers and layers of translations and changes what contained the original text. We'll never know that, or are we going? However, we can observe that the more ignorant the popular mass becomes, the easier its manipulation and domination becomes, mainly through religions. Anyway, the biblical genesis is only a summary of the much older Mesopotamian texts, but putting the Hebrew text aside, we have several other sacred texts spread across the four corners of the world each from a different mythology telling exactly the same story. The characters' names are changed, some details are changed, but the core of the narrative is always the same. At some point in Earth's past, God descended from heaven and created man. Is it really just mythology? And what is a mythological narrative, if not an attempt to be a didactic, explaining complex things by comparative means, in a language that can be understood by those who are not yet ready to understand advanced technology or procedures sophisticated by a logical doctor. When Sir Henry Lyard found Nenve buried under rubble and those clay tablets inside the ruins of Ashurbanipal II's library, and when George Smith in 1876 collected his many discoveries in a little book he titled The Chaldean Account of Genesis, or The Chaldean Genesis, which was the first book to compare the ancient text discovered in Mesopotamia with the Bible's creation and flood tales, no one knew about or even thought space travel was possible. Zakaria Sitchin could perceptively see in the intricate allegorical text what was there, uneasily and silently waiting for the time to be understood in the light of the space age. Nowadays, you just don't see those who don't want to. Modern man is still a slave, but only to his own arrogance that prevents him from seeing or accepting the obvious.